Hey there, fellow classic comic collectors. As always, my name is Scott Harris King, and today I'm bringing you another bonus video for comic book creators. And I want to talk to you about Thorny Area, its copyright and trademark, which are two different things. They, they are overlapping. There's a lot of confusion, I think, among some independent creators exactly which is which and what means what. And uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, specifically about trademark. So, as you know, I've got a new comic coming out called Cthulhu vs. Uncle Sam. And Cthulhu vs. Uncle Sam is going live on Kickstarter on June 28th. And I specifically designed this to use public domain characters. I, I talked in a previous video about the origins of the comic, where um, it started because I wanted to have a property that I could sell posters and, and other merchandise for at conventions. Um, and since my characters are not in my series, the crime busters aren't known yet. I wanted to have characters that were known, but that I could use. I didn't want to be selling like, um, you know, illicit off brand Wolverine or Deadpool or Batman merchandise. I wanted to be completely legal, something, that, but something that, that I could control creatively as well. So, I came up with the idea of this story, Cthulhu fighting Uncle Sam, both characters that are in the public domain. Now, there's a difference, though, between characters that are in the public domain, which is a copyright issue, and then characters that have been trademarked, because basically, if something has is in the public domain, that's a copyright thing. Now, right now, the copyright rules, it's 95 years is the basic. So anything right now that was published from 19 after 1925 is in the public domain because it's been 95 years since publication. There's wrinkles to that. There are things that can be in the public domain that were published more recently because the the copyright code has changed a number of times, changed in the 70s, but it also changed in the in the 60s. And so what you'll find is there are a lot of comic book properties that are in the public domain. Uh, not just comics, but let's talk specifically about comics that are in the public domain because they weren't copyrighted according to the rules at the time. Now, under the rules now, when I do my comic, The Crime Busters, <clears throat> it's sort of automatically copyrighted. It helps if I register the copyright, which is a process where I spend like $55 for the issue and I submit the story to the government um, for the copyright, and then I get a certificate saying it's been copyrighted. That gives me certain legal protections. But as soon as you create something, uh, then it you have the copyright on it. When you publish something, you get the copyright on it. In general, it's 95 years now. But back in the day, you had to register that. It was more important that you registered there. You had a certain amount of time where you needed to register it if you didn't. And when you published something, you had to print in it, that's what that little indicia is for down at the bottom, like of page one or on the inside front cover with all those little legal details. That is in there because they had to publish that to have the copyright. They had to publicly be stating, we are copywriting this. So they'd submit it for copyright. They'd publish the copyright notice inside the comic and that would give them the copyright. But there were some publishers that didn't do that. And um, particularly before 1964, you had to have that... Um, notice in there and there are publishers that didn't include the notice that's why there are certain characters that are technically in the public domain like archie for instance all the archie characters they're in the public domain because back in the 40s mlj the publisher at the time didn't include the copyright notice and so those w fell into public domain similarly the, with the crime busters i use the character of crime buster chuck chandler who is from lev gleason and they went out of business in 1956 but before 1964, you had to renew the copyrights on something that you previously copyrighted. And so because the copyright wasn't renewed in time, those fell into the public domain as well. So there's two different ways that things have gone into public domain sooner than the 95 years. I think that law changed in either 74 or 75. But for material that you, when you're back in the 60s and 50s and 40s, there's different loopholes that companies might have accidentally forgotten and, and had properties fall through that allow them to be in the public domain. Now, for me, with my comic Cthulhu vs. Uncle Sam, I don't have to worry about either of those things in terms of copyright. 
when it comes to Uncle Sam, because the character Uncle Sam has been around for over 200 years since the beginning of the 19th century. He's been used multiple times. It's been redefined, reused by lots of people, and that is clearly a public domain character. Cthulhu is a little more of an interesting proposition because a lot of those stories, um, by the original story by Lovecraft, they were published more recently than the 95 years, but most of them did not have the copyright notice associated with them that was required to be published at the time. And so they have fallen in the public domain. A little bit of a gray area with those also is that he was allowing other writers to work within his mythos even at the time he was publishing them, which creates sort of a um, creative commons sort of thing uh, where there's characters that are released into the public domain by the creator to allow other people to use them. And there's different licenses, the Creative Commons, there's a number of different licenses and how that, that sort of give you partial protection. Um, one of the most famous recent examples is there's a character called Jenny Everywhere that was specifically created for comic book creators, but also, you know, in any media to use this character. And the idea with Jenny Everywhere is that she's a character who, um, there's a version of her or in every reality, or she exists simultaneously in every possible universe so she can um be in any story at any time because she whatever cre whatever fictional universe you are working in she is in that universe um and so a lot of people have used jenny everywhere and had and had a lot of different um versions of her um that involve time travel and all sorts of different things that's creative commons and cthulhu sort of falls into that area but again, it doesn't really matter because some of the copyrights weren't followed at the time. One thing to know about this is that um, with characters like Archie specifically, let's go back to Archie as an example, only certain things are in the public domain because there's only those stories in the 40s that um, fell into the public domain. That means that if there's new things that have been added to the character since, those are not in the public domain. So... As an example, um, one of the big things, if you're a Jughead fan, is you know that um, uh, Big Ethel likes to chase him around and he doesn't want to get involved with Big Ethel. Well, Big Ethel didn't appear until Jughead number 84 in the late 50s. So you can't use Big Ethel in any of the stories or those story elements because she she wasn't around at the time. And um, Or here's, here's another example because that's a specific character. Jughead has a specific pin on his beanie. You know, he's got that iconic beanie and there's little circles and designs and squares. They're kind of abstract now, but they actually represent pins that are on her, his hat, right? Well, there was a pin that started appearing on his hat around 1980 that gives him special powers. And you can't use that pin. If, you, if you're if you doing a Jughead, even though with characters in the public domain, that specific element was created later, so that's not in the public domain. And so that becomes important if you're working with one of these characters where some stories are in the public domain and some aren't, where you have to know exactly what the thing are. There's a uh, well-known example recently um, is uh, those the Netflix movie... Um, called Enola Holmes, which is a story about uh, Sherlock Holmes's sister. So Sherlock Holmes is in the public domain, right? <clears throat> but here's where we start getting into trademark stuff and tricky things. Only some of the Sherlock Holmes stories are in the public domain, and the people that owns own the rights to whatever rights are left, um, they do spend a lot of time and energy um, filing lawsuits against people that use Sherlock Holmes. Now, 95% of the time, they actually don't have the rights and they don't have the legal standing. But what they're doing is they're trying to force the people to settle with them out of court so they get a bunch of money because it's less of a hassle than going through the thing. You know, if you're spending $20 million or $40 million to make an Enola Holmes movie... Do you want to risk the movie getting tied up in legislation for four years and risk that you'll end up being ruled against you? Or do you want to just settle for $500,000 out of court so you don't have the headache? That's what the companies like this do. And um, the Sherlock Holmes estate is one of the big ones. There's also Zorro is one you really have to watch for because that's a character, again, that's in the public domain. But they will file lawsuits against anybody who tries to use Zorro because they've trademarked all these different Zorro things. 
right? In the case of Enola Holmes, they were claiming that thematic story elements in the way that Sherlock Holmes's character was portrayed is they were basically saying in the movie he was portrayed as being too emotional and caring and that those aspects of his character weren't present in the early stories that are in the public domain. They didn't appear until the later stories that they still have the rights to. Total BS. Um, and it's, again, it's just, it's basically like legal blackmail, right? So there, there gets to be some trickier areas there. But when it comes to characters that are clearly in the public domain, but people own the trademarks too, that's where things get even trickier. That's why you don't see lots of people doing Archie comics is because even though the characters in the public domain, all of the characters' names, and in some cases uh, this gets trickier, but specific likenesses um, are also trademarked. So for instance, um, one thing that's going to be happening is we're going to see a lot of really important um, iconic characters from the 20s and 30s are about to come into the public domain. The big one being Mickey Mouse in three years is going to be in the public domain. However, because Disney has trademarked so many aspects of Mickey as a corporate symbol, it's going to be almost impossible to actually use Mickey Mouse in anything without being subject to a lawsuit. Um, Superman is another character that 10 years from now is going to be close to being in the public domain. However, the Superman symbol has been trademarked. The name Superman is trademarked. Lots of things about Superman have been trademarked, like the Fortress of Solitude or Krypton and stuff. They all have trademarks on them, right? And so if you do stories with them, you're okay, but you can't use any of those in terms of the advertising. So in terms of a comic book, you couldn't put Superman on the cover. You couldn't put the name Superman. You could, certainly couldn't put the logo because that's also been specifically trademarked. What you'd have to do is you could use Superman, not now, but again, this is 15 years from now. You could use him in the inside of the comic as a character, but you could only use the original Superman who appeared, you know, in the original stories because later editions haven't appeared yet. So it'd have to be Superman as he first appeared, um, where he like, he can't fly. He can only jump. Um, and that sort of thing. And you wouldn't be able to advertise anywhere like on the cover or anything that he's in the story, right? Uh, so it makes it really difficult to use some of these characters. Now, when I'm working on Cthulhu versus Uncle Sam, I'm free and clear on Uncle on using Uncle Sam and the visuals of Uncle Sam. Totally free and clear, you know, uh, in the public domain. Cthulhu, as I talked about, trickier, but clearly in the public domain, there's been hundreds of people that are putting out Cthulhu products and stuff, and that's no problem. And as a result of that, nobody has a trademark on anything related really to Cthulhu. I could, and everybody can use Cthulhu on their comics, and um, it's fine. There's all these Cthulhu comics and books and anything coming out, and it's totally fine. Uncle Sam, on the other hand, is a little trickier, and here's where I had to do a lot of research and just basically weighing how much risk I'm willing to assume. Um, because, of course, Uncle Sam has previously been a comic book character. Uncle Sam was a big character at Quality Comics for a long time, appearing in National Comics. He had his own quarterly comic as well in the 40s. In 1957, DC bought all of the Quality Comics and characters from Quality one of the characters that they got was Uncle Sam. Now, they didn't use Uncle Sam for a long time. It wasn't until Justice League of America 107 that they did a Crisis on Earth X storyline where the Justice Society and the Justice League crossed over into the Quality Comics universe. That had Uncle Sam and all of the other quality superheroes who at that point had not appeared in 20 plus, you know, 20 years, most of them in 20 years or more, um, and, and they did this thing where it turns out the quality universe is a world where, uh, the heroes had lost World War II. And, um, so it was an interesting thing. And then they ended up doing the Freedom Fighters comics in the seventies and Uncle Sam is the leader of the Freedom Fighters. And so DC has been using Uncle Sam and, uh, as recently as 10 years ago or 15 years ago when they were doing, um, the Infinite Crisis Crisis? Yeah, I think that was right. Um, the Infinite Crisis storyline. 
the those uh, that kicked off with that characters those characters getting killed and then they did an Uncle Sam mini series right and so they have Uncle Sam logo and um, this leads to the theoretic possibility that they might have trademarked Uncle Sam and if that's the case then if I put Uncle Sam uh, the name you know Uncle Sam on my logo it's theoretically possible if they have trademarked it that they could come after me when I launch my Kickstarter. So this is something that I had to think about. Um, luckily there are some tools available to us. So I'm gonna flip the camera around and show you a couple tools you can use um, when you're trying to figure out this. Um, not that, that's a Dungeon Master's Guide. I wouldn't suggest using that for trademark thing. First of all, for copyright, to see if something's in the public domain, the great resource you want to go to is this website called Public Domain Superheroes. Um, they have thousands of characters that have been cataloged from comic books and from other sources that are in the public domain. Now, it also has some really great information because there are some characters that you might think are in the public domain. It turns out there's trickier legal situations than you thought. One thing you want to watch out for is just because other people have used the character uh, in their comic, assuming that the characters in the public domain doesn't necessarily mean that they are. Um, in if so, for instance, if you go to on here to the Green Llama page, you'll discover some notes from the researchers here, where basically it was discovered that the Green Llama is not in the public domain. However, the person who owns the rights to Green Llama. Um, publicly said that they're fine with people using the character. So that's something where you're kind of a little bit at risk if you use it because if they change their mind for some reason or if someone else gets those rights and has a different viewpoint, suddenly you might be in trouble legally. But this is a great resource to find that stuff out, to find obscure characters, but also to find famous characters that um, you may not realize are in the public domain. So this is where you want to start, I think, if you're doing comics in terms of Copyright. For trademark, though, uh, let's go here. It's the United States Patent and Trademark Office website, and they have this thing here. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I'm going to point to it here. It's called Trademark Electronic Search System, or TESS. Right? Let me, let me get this a little bit closer. Okay. So, here's TESS, and as you can see, I've done a search for Crime Buster. Hooray! And as you can see, there's only a couple things that are live. So there's eight trademarks that have been registered. Only two of them are live, right? Now, I've looked at these before, and some of these were for the character Crime Buster. However, that's lapsed. I choose not to call my, the character Crime Buster on the cover in any way. I refer to him, if I'm going to refer to him, I usually refer to him as Chuck Chandler or CB. But other than some variant covers, I usually steer away from calling him Crime Buster. But I did make sure to register the trademark for the, my series of Crime Busters here with my logo. And um, you can see I filed this on May 15, published for opposition on September 10th, registered on November 26. So key thing here is published for opposition. So what happens is when you go to register a trademark, they put out this like magazine where it lists um, a published thing showing all the trademarks that people are registered for. Then people have a couple months to dispute those. So if you're going through that and you see, hey, someone else is is uh, trying to register Crime Busters and I've already registered Crime Busters, then I can dispute it. Or even if I don't have the trademark, but I'm currently using that name or have been for a while and I just didn't register it, I can dispute it and I can say to the government, look, um, I've been publishing a Crime Busters comic for the last 10 years and um, so that is currently in use and it's going to confuse things. And the government can decide whether or not to allow it to be trademarked. They can refuse to trademark it if you dispute something. So in this case, uh, it wasn't disputed and I got the trademark. Now, I registered the trademark for Crime Busters not because I wanted to keep other people from using it, but because I wanted to make sure that I was still able to use it. Um, specifically because, and this gets back to the Uncle Sam stuff, there is a group of characters in the DC universe called the Crime Busters. Now, DC's never really published much 
of anything with them, but they're background characters in a flashback sequence in the wa- in the Watchmen. And now that DC is doing more stuff with the Watchmen universe, I wanted to cover myself to make sure that um, if DC decides to put out a Crime Busters comic in the future, I can be like, hey, I've, I've got the trademark registered for this, so I'm not violating anything by putting out my comic, right? Um, so what you can do is you can search the different parameters. Here's a search I did for Wolverine. And uh, there's 280 Wolverine trademarks. Most of them are dead trademarks. Most of the live ones are for um, clothing and for like tools and all sorts of different things. But we can see here the trademark for the character Wolverine. Uh, it says here, owner registrant was Cadence Industries Corporation Marvel Comics Group. That's when it was last listed owner Marvel Characters Incorporated, Burbank, California. And you can see here, filing date May 14, 1985, which is kind of late in the game for this. But if you look up at the goods and services, it says publications, comic books and magazines, stories and illustrated forms. First use, June 4. 1974. So they're basically saying, hey, we're registering the trademark on Wolverine. We've been using this character for 11 years, and now we want to formally get the trademark on it. And it's still live. Every so often, I can't remember if it's five years or 10 years, but you have to renew the trademark so it doesn't lapse. Um, Or it can also lapse um, if someone else starts using it and you don't protect your trademark by challenging them. Right. So here's where we get to Uncle Sam. Um, If you look up Uncle Sam, you can see here's a list of all of the live trademarks of Uncle Sam. You can see there's not very many of them. And none of these are from DC Comics. There's the fireworks, um, clothing, different things, but none of them are from DC. Uh, It's interesting, there are certain characters and titles from DC that you would expect to be under trademark that are not listed here. Now, I should say that the trademark office has a disclaimer saying that just because something isn't in their database doesn't necessarily mean it's not trademarked. And again, if people are using it, they can still dispute you even though, even if they haven't trademarked. So one thing is, you know, I love romance comics and I've wanted to do my own romance comics for a while. After doing a search on the database, I realized that the original romance comic, Young Romance, does not seem to currently be under trademark, which is particularly odd because DC just put out an issue of Young Romance um, a couple years ago with Superman and Wonder Woman kissing on the cover. And it has the Young Romance logo along with the little R symbol saying it's a registered trademark. However, the government does not actually list it as a registered trademark. Is it worth uh, getting in a huge legal battle with the current owners of DC Comics in order to put out in my own issue of Young Romance? No, no. But is it worth putting out an issue of uncle sam with the small risk that they might um give me some hassle yeah yeah so um again i don't see any listing of uncle sam as being registered as a trademark uncle sam's much more difficult to register as a trademark because it's been in the public domain so long and the the name and the image are so ubiquitous that even though dc could make a case uh that In terms of comic books, Uncle Sam is specifically associated with DC because they have used it and they have used the name as a logo within the last decade. It gives them a pretty good case. Um, It's also just really tough to to legislate something like Uncle Sam. So for me, I've decided to go ahead and put it out. Um, If I was putting out like, let's say that I worked at Marvel and I was going to put out a comic that where I'm going to be distributing it to 3,000 comic book stores and printing 100,000 copies, would I then risk it? Probably not, because that's a whole different battle. But for the, a boutique, independently made, you know, self-published comic that's going to be on Kickstarter and that I'm hoping optimistically to sell two to 300 copies of, is that worth it? Yeah, because I'm... It's such small fry that I don't think it's worth 
the risk for them to get into it, right? Because if they take that case up and they lose, then all of a sudden everybody that wants to do it, including people like Marvel, can just have at it. So, um, yeah, for me, it's uh, it's something where um, I don't think there's a big risk and it's just really hard to trademark something like Uncle Sam. But some of these characters are trademarked. And so even if you find someone listed on the public domain superhero database that's in the public domain so you can use the character, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you can use the trademark. And, and I'll just end with a big example that I think most people are familiar with. The original Golden Age Daredevil from Lev Gleason. Um, when that went into the public domain and the trademarks lapsed, again, there was a law change in 1964. Well, you see immediately in 1964, Marvel puts out the new, their version of Daredevil because they grabbed the trademark. Stanley always loved the character Daredevil and he loved the name. So you can use the original Golden Age Daredevil character because he's in the public domain because that stuff lapsed. But you can't call him Daredevil on the cover. That's why you see this character being used all over the place, from Dynamite to lots of, you know, different places, Image. And they use the character, but they don't call him Daredevil on the cover. They'll call him Death Defying Devil, or they'll call him just Devil with like apostrophe, so you're supposed to fill in the blank yourself. Or all sorts of Dark Devil is one that I've seen on Kickstarter. Lots of people love using the character, but... You can't call him Daredevil because that's trademarked. So that's kind of a, a, the difference between the two. Um, I hope this has helped someone. And uh, if you have any questions about this, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an expert. This just comes from me researching this as much as I can before I put out my new comic, Cthulhu vs. Uncle Sam, which I'll have the links to down below. And uh, thanks very much for watching. And again, if you have any questions about the creative process or this, let me know and I'll do my best to answer them. Thanks very much.